Hey, welcome to Mineral Talks Live, the weekly live webinar that brings you in-depth and in-person interviews with the mineral people from around the world. Mineral Talks Live is brought to you by a joint effort among the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, the Society of Mineral Museum Professionals, and Blue Cap Productions. Tune in every Wednesday and stay connected to your mineral world. Now, broadcasting live from beautiful Honolulu, Hawaii, the land of aloha, ukuleles, and shakas, this is Mineral Talks Live. Hello, hello. Welcome to the 44th episode of Mineral Talks Live. Today is Wednesday, April 21st, 2021, and we're really glad that you could join us here today. For those of you new to the show, Mineral Talks Live is the weekly mineral talk show broadcasting to you live every Wednesday. I'm Brian Swoboda, the president of Blue Cap Productions, and together with my unforgettable partners, Dr. Raquel Alonso Perez from the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, and Dr. Eloise Gayou from the Society of Mineral Mineral Museum Professionals, also known as the SMMP, we want to welcome you to the show. Our goal in producing this program has always been to focus on bringing together all the different facets of our mineral world, from curatrix and curators to collectors, dealers, miners, researchers, artists, and the media that serves us all. We hope that in doing so, we show our audience how diverse our little mineral world is and provide an introduction to the vast array of characters playing in this world. As an audience, we invite you to participate and interact with us and with each other throughout the show. Think of this more as, a, as an interactive show versus a show where you just sit and watch. However, if you want to just sit and watch, you can do that too. But if you really want to get involved, there are two ways in which you can do so. Both of these ways are located at the bottom of your screen in the form of buttons that you'll see in your Zoom interface. The chat feature allows you to type messages to everyone watching and participating in the show. So when you first sign on, feel free to fire off a chat message to everyone telling us where you're from. If you have thoughts or comments during the show, this is where you can post them. Now, during the interview, my guests and I may not see all of your chat messages, especially with these old eyes, but both Raquel and Eloise will be very active in those chats, so look for their comments and links. When appropriate, either Raquel or Eloise may address us directly with some of your questions. Now, the second way to interact is with the Q&A function. This allows you to submit general questions that we'll try to answer at the end of the interview. Finally, at about 40 minutes into the program, you'll see a window pop up on the screen asking a bunch of questions for our weekly poll. This is one of our favorite parts of the show as it allows us to learn small, random, and oftentimes interesting little facts about our guests. And now, on to the most interesting part of the show. Today's guest is a curatrix, but she's not a curatrix of a museum. No, she curates a private collection of gemstones, minerals, jewelry, and objects to art, the quality of which you'd expect to see in a museum. You'd think that as a private collection, most people wouldn't get a chance to see the pieces in this collection, and you'd be absolutely wrong. All the people associated with this collection that currently contains over 1,800 pieces believe that this collection should not only be seen, but it should be used as a tool to educate people and to foster a better understanding and appreciation of all the different worlds and people that have been combined to create this collection. The collection, of course, is the Somewhere in the Rainbow collection, and the curatrix of it is none other than our very own jalapeno firecracker, Shelly Sargent. Shelly, how are you today? Good morning. Wow, that was quite an introduction, Brian. Thank you so much. Uh, it's beautiful. It's sunny and fabulous in Arizona, and uh, we're looking forward to the whole rest of the mineral and gem world getting back to Arizona so we can all come together and celebrate so many fantastic things happening in our industry. So thanks for having me. Thanks for being on the show, Shelly, and it, you look fantastic. And uh, uh, like you say, the weather is great out there, so... Um, we all got to get our, our uh, Arizona fix in pretty soon. Now, yes. Shelly, on the show, as you know, I like to turn back the clock on our guests. And I have a note saying that I have to use my deep voice now. So <clears throat> let me try this. You started as a gift wrapper. And currently, you're the curatrix of one of the best gem and jewelry collections in the USA. Now, somewhere in there, you were exposed to some mineral or gemstone or jewelry where you just heard that kind of little click that told you that this was going to be your life. What was that click and what caused it? 
So you're right. I did. I started at age 16 as a gift wrapper and a glass cleaner for sales jewelers in a little tiny town in Colorado. Um, and that's wow. all I was allowed to do was gift wrap. And I was only supposed to be there for six weeks. So 38 years later, I've never left the industry. And um, I love it as much today or probably more than I ever have um, because I've been exposed to so many wonderful things. But I remember the moment that it that it hit me um, and and. I, it's one of those things that I kick myself for, but I was working for Zales and I went there um, as a favor to one of my mom's friends. And I thought it was going to be cool to work there because all the boys hung out at the mall and I got to get dressed up to go to work. So um, I loved that. Anyway, um, as you know, the Christmas season kind of wind, wound itself down. Um, I was invited to stay on as a member of the team. And um, I, immediately fell in love with this fantastic um, two carat yoga sapphire and diamond right ring. On. And um, it had this beautiful, you know, the ballerina setting of, you know, we're talking in the eighties um, and, mm -hmm. and it had this beautiful ballerina setting around this fantastic two carat um, yoga sapphire. And that was the piece that just sucked me in. Um, I put it on layaway <laughs> and I think it took me about a year to pay it off. Um, and I, I loved it. Um, and I kicked myself because at some point I traded it in and I probably got a diamond or something. I don't know. But anyway, that was it. That was, that was the moment for me. That was the stone that made the whole world change. Well, that's incredible. You have exceptional taste. A two carat yoga sapphire is not something that's common at all. <laughs> yeah. Well, and again, if I had known that then, what I what we know now, right? Hindsight is always twenty twenty. But um, yeah, I don't know whatever happened to that ring, but it was a it was a fascinating purchase, and it was my first purchase in the jewelry industry. So oh, that is fantastic. Okay, so the click happened, and somehow from the little Yogo Sapphire ring, or I shouldn't say little, the quite large Yogo Sapphire ring, to the creation of Somewhere in the Rainbow. That's a, that's a long journey. Uh, tell us about that and kind of how you went down that road. So um, I was really fortunate actually to have phenomenal mentors throughout all of my career. Uh, I was with the Zale Corporation um, for many years until they actually purchased, uh, until peoples from Canada purchased um, the Zale, you know, bought the company from the Zale family. Um, and mm. quite honestly, um, excuse me, my allergies are crazy. Um, uh -oh. It was uh, it was a great journey, actually. The Zale family took very good care of me, and um, they just opened up the whole world of education. So that was really fantastic. Um, I went into middle management, store management, middle management, corporate management, um, finally decided that that just wasn't where I wanted to be. So I took out on the road with a company called Dave Downey Designs. We did remount shows all over the country. They based in Indianapolis. Um, and that was really fun. I was one of only three women on the road at the time. So I, I kind of felt like I was a pioneer in that. So that was yes, fun. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and then after a couple of years, of course, that gets really tiring because you're on the road for 10 to 12 weeks at a time without ever touching home base. So anyway, the long and short of the story is I went back into retail. Um, I went back into management and um, I had a fantastic career in retail for many years. I worked for some fabulous design houses. I worked with some amazing designers, cutters, um, hand fabricators. I really learned the industry. And uh, I was working for a design house here in Arizona. Um, and top of the line color, like that's really what they specialize in. That's still what they specialize okay. in. And I had a wonderful opportunity to just learn the best of the best. And uh, I took advantage of that every moment that I could. And um, somewhere in the rainbow began at a retail store, actually, here in Arizona. Interesting. And um, a gentleman came in um, to purchase a sapphire for his wife. And we got to talking the differences between um, heated sapphires and no heat sapphires and the price differences. And he was amazed, <laughs> obviously, at the price difference. Okay. Um, and at the end of our session, you know, we talked about rarity. We talked about how special it is to have a no heat Sri Lanka sapphire. And he purchased a fantastic no heat. Uh, we put it in a beautiful diamond ring mounting and out the door he went. 
Um, we were, uh, the store then actually sent out a postcard uh, all about Alexandrite a few weeks later. And he called and he thought that, you know, it was kind of fascinating. So he did some research on Alexandrite. Right. And this was really the turning point. This is when the collection started completely by accident. So um, I I contacted a very good gem industry and um, I said, you know, I've got a client that's interested in looking at Alexandrite, but instead of just memoing goods to me, um, I would prefer that, you know, you come and actually give this client an experience, which Great. the owner of the store was a little, okay. Yeah. They were a little upset with me because you don't put your retail clients in front of a wholesaler. Um, right. It's just not commonly done, but um, I just, he, he interest really just kind of shown through. And so we brought them into office and um, uh, Evan Kaplan, um, who was with Omi Gems at the time, he's a gem broker for those of you who might not know Evan and Omi. Um, he came and we gave them a fantastic lesson in Alexandrite. Um, and he brought, you know, a one carat, a two carat, a 465. Um, and then, you know, Evan always has a surprise when he shows up. So he reaches in and he pulls out, you know, a 10 and a half carat Alexandrite Brazilian. And wow. it was amazing. I, I'll never forget looking over his shoulder and getting chills because I had never seen a 10 and a half carat Alexandrite. So um, anyway, at the end of the day, uh, you know, we, we played outside with lighting. We brought it back in and the whole yeah. thing. We gave him um, the best experience that I think that we could. And um, the the wife of Somewhere in the Rainbow, um, she reached over and she grabbed the 465 cushion and she set it off to the side, never said a word. And uh, he picked up this 10 and a half and was just fascinated with it. And he looked at her and she said, no, 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 I'm not interested in that one. Um, but I do want to talk about this 465. And um, he picked it up again and she said, no, 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 I, I'm, I'm not interested in that one. He said, well, I might be. And he put it in the middle of the table and I went, oh, shit, I'm going to get fired. <laughs> There's a lot of money sitting right there on the table right now. Um, and in the end, they ended up with this fantastic 10 plus carat Brazilian and a 465 cushion uh, with about a 92 percent color change. Wow. So they got both. Tonight. And that's how it started. That is fantastic. And I love that both of the stories begin with sapphires. That's amazing to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it was, um, it was, and even then, you know, it wasn't ever meant to be, we were never meant to grow into an educational resource within the industry. Right. They were going to make a couple of pretty pieces of jewelry, um, which they did. They have some pretty fascinating jewelry for those who have seen the collection, but um they were so fascinated with the whole Alexandrite story. The next stone that I gave them to study was Padparaja Sapphire because I thought uh -huh. Alex went pretty well. So, um, you know, their next purchase was a 936 oval Padparaja Sapphire. And um, and again, it just, you know, they, they, they found the passion and they found the the rarity and um, our appraiser um, whose name is Craig Lynch, um, you know, Craig gave them really good advice in the beginning. He said, never buy the biggest of anything, mm. buy the best quality of whatever it is that you can afford and always go for quality. And so somewhere sure. in the rainbow yeah. eventually was born out of that philosophy. Um, we continued to acquire, we continued to be inquisitive. They continued to um, just follow the advice of these amazing people that they had around them. And, um, and I'm thankful to, to be the face to, to what they have created because in 2011, we actually took the collection private um, we found a private space and we be, we created an LLC. They were very much in um, engaged in wanting to make it an educational resource within the industry and not just hide it away in a vault. And so mm -hmm. somewhere in the rainbow, the rainbow was born from that dream and from that passion. Um, they choose to remain anonymous because they don't do this for the, um, you know, for the, this is not for them to go out in the world and be seen. Um, it's, it's about their collection.
acting and their passion. And there were a lot of un- disbelievers when we started. Trust me, we had a lot of um, uh, a lot of adversity in the beginning because you know dealers were like, "Who the hell does this? Like, who buys at this level and doesn't ever sell anything?" And so, right, you know, okay. it, it took some time for our mission to become known and to be accepted. And they've really allowed me um, a wonderful amount of leeway to create what we have today. Well, Shelley, it's fascinating because one of my questions that I wanted to ask you was after the start of Somewhere in the Rainbow, you had a bunch of roads that you could go down and you chose this uh, this road where you incorporate all different uh, people at different levels of, um, uh, of the process from the miners to the cutters to the, uh, uh, the jewelry designers. And I was going to ask you how you got there, but it has kind of become clear just in your answer that uh, the reason it really started was your ability to realize that this this opportunity is best going to be uh, taken advantage of, not in a bad way, but uh, fulfilled in education. And so you brought in your wholesaler who gave a great education. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it feels like that's what really started shaping what eventually became Somewhere in the Rainbow. I agree. I agree 100%. Um, You know, when I guess I can look and I can say that one of the things that I love that the owners absolutely empower me to do is to always give credit where credit is due. Yes. You know, to whereas good. um, you know, your retail stores or even your designers, you know, they can't they can't put their suppliers' names on their pieces. Of course, you know, it right. would be totally counterproductive to them. Um, but for us, uh, I look at our collection now. Oh, and I, you know, 125 participants in our collection from our industry. And wow. um in 2011, Loretta Cooper from the Smithsonian um, came with Dr. Post and um, we were going through the collection and she asked me a really important question that I couldn't answer. And her question was, what is somewhere in the rainbow? What defines who you are? Because it's a great you, question. you have miners and you have cutters and you have designers and you have finishers and you have labs and you have, right, you, you're all over the board what defines the the road that you're going to go down? And it took me some time to answer her. Um, And when I did, I was actually standing with Eric Fritz at the podium in um, Tucson at the University of Arizona. We were Mm -hmm. announcing the museum, um, the the secondary education um, of of the gemology program. And and, um, sadly, Loretta wasn't in the audience, but I was able to answer her question in the fact that somewhere in the rainbow um, is a community. And we're a community of people right. from mining and minerals. You know, a lot of people look at us as strictly a gem and jewelry collection, and that is our focus. But we also mm-hmm. believe in the whole world of Mother Nature and the beauty that she brings us in minerals. And sometimes they're better left alone, leave them alone, right? And then others are really cut up and we get really pretty thank you thank you for not completely going over to the dark side there shall dark side for us mineral people that everything needs to be cut that's the dark side so thank you for not being there yeah yeah yeah. no there there are yes certain specimens you just leave alone i mean can you imagine somebody cutting up the jonas rubellite right that would be sacrilege anyway um so I, i my answer is that we are a community of people we are a community of givers and Um, everybody brings forth education. Even if you're a jewelry designer, you're educating through your art and through your work. Um, If you're a miner, you're bringing, you're bringing mother nature's art to, to a whole world to be seen and enjoyed. And so we just believe that, you know, to lock it up in a vault really isn't, that isn't the direction that we wanted to go. So we're really, we've been very fortunate and um, people have really surrounded us with a lot of love and a lot of support. And, um, you know, it, t- it took a couple of years of convincing, but here we are. So, you know, every time, if you see me on Facebook or you see me on social media, you're always going to see that credit is given where credit is due. If you're a miner, we're going to say that this is what you did. And if you're a cutter or a designer or a finisher or a lab or whatever, like it's really important to us to, to take out a message to the end consumer.
the hands that these really fantastic rarities travel through to get to the end consumer. And so it's, I think it's, a, it's just a great story. No, it absolutely is. Uh, I've always said that, and kind of the uh, catalyst behind the start of Blue Cat Productions was that uh, every great mineral specimen has a wonderful human story behind it. And I've always focused on that, and I love that, uh, that human part of it because it goes hand in hand with the natural beauty that we see. And you're, you right now are preaching to the choir. You are saying the exact same thing. Um, but you're also um, you're unique in the sense that you are going out and acknowledging and bringing everybody up and incorporating that story and all the people and all the souls affiliated with the finished piece into your exhibits. And I think uh, I think that's really great. High high fives for that. Um, you did talk about um, the belief that the collection doesn't deserve to be in a vault, it deserves to be exhibited. And I know that you're working very closely with the new uh, Alfie Norville uh, Gem and Mineral Museum at U of A in Tucson. Tell us what you're doing there and what we can expect to see when we when we visit the museum. Oh, well, you know, the, my story with, um, with this started um, if almost, it's been almost five years ago, um, pretty close, that, um, Eric Fritz and Bob Downs from the University of Arizona and I were all having lunch sitting outside at a beautiful um, little restaurant in downtown Tucson. And Eric is actually the one that kind of threw it out and he said, wouldn't it be cool if we could bring gemology to a university level? Mm. And we mm -hmm. all went, wow, how would that, be? How, what does that look like? Um, and Bob Downs was completely fascinated with the concept. The next thing Eric knew, the next week, he found himself sitting in the Dean um, Joaquin Ruiz's office and everybody became like, why are, why are we not doing this? Why, what, what yeah. would be a reason not to do this? And so originally somewhere in the rainbow, um, because our mission is education, was going to be to underwrite the um, endowment of a chair for the university to actually start this program. Um, okay. And as it turned out, the university, what the, what, what the museum needed to really kick uh, to get off the ground um, was a director. And so um, our friends at The Real Real actually uh, stepped up and said, well, we want to underwrite this chair position, um, which they have done. And um, I'm really excited to say that I, I think we have classes that are going to be starting in the fall of this year. Um, so that's, that's exciting. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, in order for the museum to happen, there needed to be a director. And um I just didn't think of anybody better than the person who actually threw it out into the world. And, and sometimes what you put out there, you know, Eric, if you're watching, careful what you wish for, because you just <laughs> might get it. Um, he turned out to be the perfect person. And we were able to work with the university and get that position going. Um, I was honored to be invited to be a board member um, on the board for the university and for the museum, which is a fantastic working board and an advisory board. And I'm honored to be a part of that as well. Um, and so then it was a matter of, okay, so how do we use somewhere in the rainbow to fulfill our mission of education and beauty mm -hmm. and storytelling? And so we made the entire collection available to the university um, for exhibition, for study, for testing, um, guest lecturing, um, uh, being able to hand off um, really fabulous study gemstones to students where, you know, normally we look at study samples and we go, eh, yeah, they're, you know, they're not great. Um, right. So we want them to get their hands on great material. We want them to know, like, this is where you set a standard and, and, right. and to to study with that. And so um, really, I think that we're involved in as many aspects as we can. Um, I'm probably, you know, most famous for being a cheerleader <laughs> more than anything <laughs> else. And, and I love that. So you're going to see a whole gem hall and a whole treasury that is full of somewhere in the rainbow, but it's not about somewhere in the rainbow pieces. It's about the stories of the pieces, where sure, they yeah. come from, um, the, the designers that designed 
design these fantastic treasures, the jewelers that create them, the miners that mine the stones. And, you know, um, I think, Brian, somewhere in our um, photo gallery today, we we actually have a piece that we can walk you from mine to yeah. the piece actually being finished and it's on exhibit in Tucson. So that's um, going to be exciting. Yeah. Yeah. It's really um, exciting. Yeah, Shelley, let me ask you one more question before we get on to looking at some of the incredible pieces, because I think this is a topic that to me is very, very uh, important and, and it, it actually warrants a much longer and broader conversation. But, you know, with the pandemic basically shutting down the world, you've had a chance to focus internally for a while and do something that I think is critical and important for all of us to start talking about. And that's a deaccession strategy. Can you share with us what you've done? I mean, very briefly and kind of put give us your perspective on why it's important to do that now before it's actually needed. Yeah. Uh, wow. So I have to tell you, it was really the owners of the collection that had this idea that while we were under, you know, our offices were closed and we were under lockdown, um, we still had the opportunity to see one another, which was great because, you know, we all needed that human interaction. Um, and, you know, we never want to look at, you know, nobody ever wants to talk about the hard fact that, you know, at some point we're all going to pass on from this world and, right. you know, um, how we make people feel while we're here is really our legacy. Um, so we decided to sit down during the pandemic and actually decide every piece in the collection, what's going to happen to it. Um, and it was a Fantastic. daunting task, <laughs> let me tell you. It wasn't easy. Um, but, you know, there are certain things that they want to gift to their family or friends. There are certain things that they want to gift to museums. And how do I de identify which museum? Mm -hmm. um, there are certain pieces that will continue to live on, um, you know, in in their honor and their, their memory for, for eons to come. And um, so it, it was important. And the one thing that I will continue to tell people um, that I learned going through this process is make your wishes known while you have the ability to do that. 100%. Don't wait for your family to figure that out or your, you know, I now know. So God forbid, please know, but if something were to happen to our owners um, and it, it makes me teary to even think about that. So I'm not going to, um, but if, if something were to happen to them, I know what they want. The attorneys know what they want. The museums know what they want. Their children, their family. It, it allows the collection to continue to be celebrated mm -hmm. and not be at the not be at the forefront of controversy. Absolutely. And I would submit that it actually allows you to enjoy the collection more because now you don't have to worry about that. Earlier in the program, we had Jack Halpern on, who um, I think uh, he was 100 years old when he came on. And we looked at his collection and we talked very uh, briefly about uh, the plan that he, ha he has in place of what's going to happen in that collection when he passes on. And I think with that worry out of the picture, Jack's able to enjoy his collection even more. And I would, I would suspect it's the same uh, with the owners of the Somewhere in the Rainbow collection. Yeah, and I have to tell you, I look at the pieces differently now. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's something that you might not suspect. But, you know, when I walk past, you know, uh, any one of the pieces and I know in my mind where that piece is going to end up, it really makes me smile. What? Wow, because that is a that's that's a fantastic it. perspective. Yeah, yeah, I can now associate it to not only being in the collection, but I know where it's going to go and reside, and 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 the thought process that went into it. So I look at that piece differently now. Shelley, that is wonderful. Thank you for that perspective. I never even thought of that, but now you can look at pieces and you can smile, picturing, oh, that piece is going to be in this museum, and you're thinking of the people that are looking at it and learning from it. And it, it takes on kind of a different life of itself. That's fantastic. That's wonderful. Yeah. It was great. And, and I can tell you, any collectors that are on, in our audience, um, by all means, I encourage you to do this really daunting task. And, and it takes some time to kind of get in the groove of it. But yeah. once you do, you know, I, I was shocked. Well, I shouldn't say I was shocked. Um, I was touched 
by the thoughtfulness that the owners put into choosing where their collection pieces will go. Um, and it was it was eye-opening, it was thoughtful. Um, many of the people uh, that we have actually done business with um, will actually get a nice surprise because they're gonna get one of their pieces back. And what they choose Fantastic. to do with it will be entirely up to them. And so, you know, it, uh, yeah, it, it, it's really important and don't wait. Uh, during the process, did you find uh, new revelations in terms of how the owners uh, responded or felt about a certain piece that you didn't realize before? Yes, 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 yes. So, um, you know, without giving away too much, I'll, I'll just kind of, <laughs> I'll, tell, I'll tell one little story. So we have a terrific relationship with um, Chris Smith at AGL Labs in New York. Um, mm -hmm. And we trust Chris. We, we use him often. He's actually uh, listed as a member of our um, community uh, on our insurance policy, right? So like he's very close to us. Forgive me. Um, anyway, um, Chris collects colorless gemstones, he owns a colored Somebody gem lab you. and he, he <laughs> collects colorless gemstones, which really, when you think about it, there's not a lot of them. Um, so there's, you know, some special colorless gemstones that at the end of the collection will find their way to Chris to add to his collection as a way of saying thank you for your participation in what we have done and for your, um, for your knowledge and for your time and for your care. And, and, and it's a way of saying thank you. Wonderful, so it's cool. Wonderful, wonderful. I love it. I love it. Shelly, let's start looking at some of the pieces. I have some photos of some pieces. You have some live pieces. So um, I'm not quite sure how we want to start. Well, I know how I want to start this. I want to show. OK, thank you. I want to start with uh, um, perhaps the most uh, treasured uh, piece of it's not really the uh, in the rainbow collection, but it is, I, I, I think it's one of your most treasured piece, a piece. Am, am, oh. am I correct in my assumption? <laughs> That's my best work ever, right there. Absolutely. Those your are my finest creation. gems right there. And um, for those of you who may not know, this is my daughter. Her name is Bree. And uh, this is my granddaughter, Genova. And this was uh, last Christmas time. And um, that's my that's the best work I've ever done right there. I think that is such a beautiful photograph. So sorry for springing that on you. I may have brought a little bit of tears to the eye, but I thought it'd be wonderful anyway. Definitely. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you. That was very sweet. Okay, uh, shall we start with some photos or do you want to start with some uh, live pieces and then uh, we can cut away to photos uh, once, you start, um, once you start sharing them? Again, it's your show. You tell me. I think that I, I, there's actually a story that I would really, you know, like to tell that I think gives a really great um, overall perspective of what Somewhere in the Rainbow does. And so if you could bring up the piece of Tanzanite Rough. Absolutely. It's on my screen now. Um Forgive me, you made me cry, and now my nose is I running. Know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you for that. It was great. Um, so the piece that we're looking at here, uh, which I have to tell you, I didn't even know that the a photo of this rough existed until after the piece was finished. Um, so, it, but this is where we start. Um, so these beautiful pieces um, of, of rough material, you know, come out of the ground. This is tanzanite. Uh, it's a no heat tanzanite. Mother Nature made this color all by herself. Um, the rough was actually purchased by a gentleman named Don Johnson. Don is a sapphire miner in uh, Montana. Uh, although at the time he, he didn't own his own mine, now he does. Uh, he actually purchased this piece of rough from um, Steve Yultowski, which a lot of you, many of you know, even in the mineral and the gem world. Um, uh, Don gave that piece of rough to a gentleman named Jeff Hapeman, and Jeff is in Pennsylvania. Uh, Jeff has probably 60, maybe 70 stones in uh, the Summer in the Rainbow collection. So this rough went to Jeff and Jeff created this fantastic uh, approximately 12 and a half carat um, tanzanite. And you can see how he oriented this material to be so beautifully purple on the ends. It's got this fantastic, beautiful blue that runs through the center. And if you know Jeff Hateman's cutting, you could walk into a museum anywhere 
any time and look at this and say, it's Jeff. It is signature style to Jeff. So we held the stone privately in the collection. And the way that our jewelry pieces get made is very unique in the fact that um, we don't uh, we don't just send gemstones to designers and say, okay, here, you know, make something with this. We actually invite designers into our offices and we lay out gemstones in front of them. And we wa- I watch how they react. I watch the response to the pieces. Right. And I know nice. when something has hit a heart and they go, oh yeah, I'm going to create something spectacular with this. And this is one of those stories. Um, young Lindsay J. Jane from California. Uh, she's a fantastic young designer. Uh, she just, this stone just hit her. And, and, and I knew that she was going to create something magnificent with it. So um, a couple of months later, she took the stone. Um, she sent me some sketches and some drawings. Um, here is one of her beautiful sketches. Uh, and she had a vision for this piece. She wanted to give it, she wanted it to take flight. She wanted it to become um, a beautiful butterfly um, in flight. And so we went directly from her finished sketch and we ended with this fantastic piece of jewelry. And this is our process. If you look at the sides of this frame, Brian, I think you've got those photos as well. I love this. Um, I mean, see this side very, shot really kind of brings it to life. Of her butterfly in flight, and mm-hmm. uh, it's accented with um, beautiful pink sapphires, moonstone, um, diamonds. It's done in 18 karat gold, and it's a great story of how pieces find themselves. You know, how how we get pieces from rough to finished why we find that they're important. I I will tell you, I cannot think of a time in the history of Somewhere in the Rainbow that a designer has brought us a a thought of their design, what they envision that the owners have said no, right? Because it's about bringing that vision to life and supporting their, their thought processes. And so we love this ring from Lindsay Jane and uh, we're really excited to have it. You'll see it on exhibit in, um, in Tucson in the new acquisitions case as soon as you walk through the front door. You know, Shelly, I love your process that you bring in a designer that you trust and you put the stones in front of the designer and you sit there and you watch that designer because the uh, criteria to get them in the door is that uh, you basically, you trust them. And then you're looking for that natural reaction, that spark of excitement when they see the stone. And when that happens, then the piece is is put into production. And this is such a great example. This is an exceptional looking ring uh, from this top down view. Absolutely beautiful, great cut by Jeff. But to me, it really kind of starts taking off when you look at it from the side here. I mean, it and and the word that you used to describe it was butterfly, and it's got that ethereal lightness to it that just it speaks so strongly to the label that you've given it. Wonderful, wonderful job. Even more important. So here's something that a lot of people don't think about. So let's talk about the importance of this. Mm. It's the collaboration, right? Yes. So. Steve brings this rough stone to a Don Johnson, Don Johnson to Jeff Hateman, Jeff Hateman to somewhere in the rain or, you know, into us somewhere in the rainbow to Lindsay Jane and now onto the museum. So there is a beautiful collaboration story that I think is so special about somewhere in the rainbow Um, because without all of these collaborations, you know, I, I, I've always had a saying since we've started the collection that mother nature gives us rocks and gem cutters give us gems and designers give us heirlooms. And you can't have one without the other. They're all so important and so interconnected. And so for us being able to tell this collaborative story is a beautiful part of our mission. And I I just love watching it from rough to finish. Um, There's a fantastic designer. His name's Eddie Sakamoto. Um, Hi, if you are Eddie. Um, Mm -hmm. But Eddie has 47 pieces in the Summer in the Rainbow collection. Yeah. No, absolutely wonderful. And the fact that you wanted to show this first and share that story, and uh, we don't have the time to go into that depth of the story for all the pieces, but the very fact that the audience can see how 
that entire story fits in and know that when they go see these pieces on exhibit, they will get a better idea of that entire story is wonderful. And you certainly, I mean, you said that you acknowledge all the people along the way and you certainly just have. So um, I'm going to ask that the poll be launched. We are going to go long because it's going to be, it's going to be worth it. So let's go on to, uh, let's go on to the next, uh, next piece of jewelry here. Um, sorry, I've got a poll in front of me. I'm going to move this. Oh, yeah. oh you're not allowed before. to read that. Uh, okay, I won't read it. Um, I'm just going <laughs> to click off. So there we go. Um, so what you're looking at here is one of the most spectacular pieces of jewelry, I think, in our collection. Uh, the stone came to us loose. Uh, it's an 1855 um, trillion Mahenge spinel. Uh, it sat loose in our collection for a really long time. We kept it loose for a long time. And um, I'll never forget when the gentleman named Zoltan David, who bases in Austin, uh, the first time he saw this stone, I watched this strong man, like just turn into this emotional mess. And uh, it was fantastic. Um, and I knew that he was the right man. You know, this isn't a gemstone that you hand off to a rookie. And, and I don't right. mean, I mean, we love the young up and comers and we promote them and, and we love working with them, but this is a really serious stone and it deserved a really serious house. And um, Zoltan is a really serious designer. So the thing that I love about this ring is that he, he sat with it and and he allowed it to evolve and what he turned it into, uh, it's actually named the Queen's Ring. He actually named it uh, the Queen's Ring. And it's named because he has so much respect and love for the owner of the, the uh, wife of the owner of the collection. Um, but it's very unique in the fact that uh, it's done in platinum and uh, 18 karat gold. And you'll see all the trillion diamonds that go around the stone that lead up to it. He allowed the stone to be the focus and um but i don't know anybody else i've never seen this done before all of those trillion diamonds are paved and for those who may not know the jewelry industry and the jewelry setting techniques it's a technique in stones that is done with rounds often to do it with trillions with those little corners that can chip so easily. It really is a masterful piece. Uh, all the red that you see, the accent stones are all um, uh, Spinel Melly that he had cut for this project. Uh, you'll see a lot of signature designs from Sultan in the beading that runs in between what we will call, let's say, the crown uh, for the queen, mm -hmm. and then going on to like the pavilion, what we would expect to, to the the girdle um, to be. I'm not the pavilion. I'm sorry. So you know, there's a lot of signature Zoltan David. Um, but here's what I love about this piece is that. He never for a moment wavered that it was going to be a very important piece of jewelry and to tell this Mahenge story. And he did it brilliantly. So uh, it's also in the new acquisitions case. Uh, it's a Spectrum Award winner this year. Uh, AGTA, the American Gym Trade Association, uh, has an award program every year, a competition every year. And uh, this is actually a winner for uh, Zoltan David um, via Somewhere in the Rainbow. Um, but uh, we're, we're really thrilled to have it. And so thank you to everyone involved in that piece. Absolutely stunning. Uh, let's go on to um, another ring here that uh, is just beautiful, the, the, the subtle shading of this. Thank you. Um, I, I, I actually get to take credit for this. This is actually my design. So I didn't know we were going to talk about it. But thank you. It's um, So this is a 451 fantastic Pod Paraja Sapphire No Heat. Um, this was the second Pod Paraja that was purchased in the collection, and it came a couple of years after the, um, the 936. Uh, it's just a it's a perfect example of 
what we expect Pod Paraja to look like. And this photo is probably um, a little blown up that we don't really get to see that fantastic pink and orange combination, but it really is um, dreamy. Somebody just said a dream. Uh, I just saw that. And it is, it's a dreamy <laughs> gemstone. Um, when I saw it, the very first thing that I thought of when I was, uh, had the great fortune to be, to be um, named to design with it, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to keep the warm tones of the stone. And so the rose gold really lent itself to um, surrounding the stone. Uh, the creation was actually done by a gentleman uh, jeweler named Sean Ryan. Um, who was in Phoenix at the time. Uh, he's since moved, but uh, he did a beautiful job of showing the way that I wanted this piece to almost be like a flower and for these petals to surround oh, yeah. this Paraja. But really the star of the show in this is that fantastic Paraja, And the, you'll have an opportunity to interact with this piece in the museum as well. Fantastic. Great choice uh, for the use of the rose gold there. It's Thank very, you. very subtle, but once you realize it, there could be no other intelligent choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. White would have probably washed it out more. I really wanted, the, it was important for me that the stones stay very warm because I think yeah. of Pod Paraj as being a very warm, bright, but warm gemstone. That's a that's what I like to call a headache ring. When you wear it, you're always saying, oh, my head. <laughs> what oh. a headache. <laughs> <laughs> that's like a okay. be still my heart oh uh, this exactly is, this is a super cool piece this is brand new to us actually um i have to tell you it went out for competition last year at the agta um, spectrum awards and the owner had never even seen it so <laughs> it happens that way sometimes <laughs> uh it's a fantastic gray um the, the photo doesn't necessarily show it the best but it's actually a gray green tone of tourmaline uh again it was an immediate reaction from paul klecka uh who paul is now the uh, the new incoming president for the american jewelry design council um and he's been creating fabulous pieces of jewelry for a very long time anyway uh he saw the stone and he wanted to really just do something knock out with it. And uh, he met up with his friend, um, Tom Finneran, who at the time was in Colorado Springs. He's now in New Mexico. And he's known for his fantastic carving. Uh, the name of the designer is Paul Klecka. Um, so he uh, had um, Tom go in and carve this fantastic blue Guatemalan jade. And wow. uh, my gosh, it's the faceting on the jade is a story all in itself. Like we could do a whole education series on just this ring. Um, and then it's done in 18 karat gold. Um, it's got some Egyptian, Egyptian um, porphyry around the, the, the bezel. Um, the sleeve is all done in 18 karat. Uh, Christo is the gentleman that actually set all the stones and he did a fantastic job of bringing this piece together. So this is a gentleman's ring um, that is fantastic blue Guatemalan jade and tourmalina. We absolutely love it. It's wonderful. I love how the design just keeps drawing the eye back up to the tourmaline in the center. It's just well, wonderful. And, you know, wonderful. one of the things that I love about this piece too is again, it it takes us back to the use of materials and how they do work together so beautifully. Absolutely. Um, you know, whoever would have thought of putting Guatemalan jade with tourmaline, but it works and, and, and it's a fantastic masculine, strong piece of jewelry. So we love that. You know, and I, I even love the gold ring that's inset in the middle of the jade because it echoes the design that's on the top that's uh, uh, holding the tourmaline in. And there are just so many elements on this that just uh, speak to itself and it kind of brings the eye constantly back to this piece. You could look at this, it's like a Mobius strip. You just keep staring at it forever. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great design. It was a great make and we're really, really proud of, of having this piece. That's beautiful. Now I'm going to pull up another ring and I know that you, whoops, I know that you have this one uh, live with you, but let's look at a picture first and then we'll cut to your, uh, um, your live view of it. Okay. So um, yeah, this is, well, this is another be still my heart kind of piece, but uh -huh. it started, uh, I met, a uh I met a couple named Danny and Michelle Hatcher, uh, who are opal miners um, in Australia, and um, they're multi-generational, um, 
And Danny, obviously, he does uh, the mining, but Michelle is actually the cutter. So she cuts all of their opal, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, so I met them doing an educational series with Jewelry Television in Knoxville, Tennessee. And they had come over from Australia and I immediately just fell in love with them and their story. Uh, it's fascinating and we don't have time to tell it, but it is a great story. They ended up coming to Scottsdale. They met with the owners of the collection, and this uh, opal was chosen for our collection. Uh, it's a 976, I do believe, uh, black opal, and I immediately named it the Dark Knight. Um, <laughs> I, and that's just the first thing that came to me, and, and I'm pretty I famous for Batman. naming a lot of our pieces. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, it should be like on Batman's chest shield or something. Totally, anyway, totally. Um, it set loose for a very long time. And a lot of designers are actually very um, skeptical of leery of working with Opal because, you know, when you've got a fantastic mm -hmm. specimen like this, a hundred different things could go wrong when you set it. But Adam Neely stepped into my office one day and he was not scared of this baby at all. He was like, I'm taking that stone. And, um, <laughs> and he let it sit and formulate for a long time. Um, actually, if you can pull up the photo of his um his there diagram yeah okay so this is adam neely's you know men's black opal night ring this is all of this is all him and these were his thoughts so he set about doing this ring and uh he knew that he wanted savorite and sapphire uh on the sides but he couldn't find anybody that had the baguette cut um sapphires so in the end, okay. he went to Bruce Bridges, um, who is a very good friend of the collection and just the gem trade as a whole, um, as well as the mineral people. Mm -hmm. I think everybody knows Bruce and the story of, of Bruce Bridges. Yeah, um, and he'd be a fascinating talk, by the way. Anyway, um, Bruce, it was like, Absolutely. you know, I'm just going to, we'll, we'll, we'll cut them. We'll cut everything. And so he took it upon himself to uh, have his cutter in Kenya actually uh, cut all of the baguettes that literally look like a stained glass window. If we can go back to the ring, you'll see that um, the outer side, uh, the out. Uh, the outer part of the ring, of course, is all white and that inset is all yellow. Mm -hmm. What Adam did here was absolutely fascinating. He put no pressure on this opal at all. He made the sleeve of yellow gold. It actually insets into the white outer. And so he never, ever had to actually touch or push metal down over that stone. Wow. So it's brilliant in its design. Uh, it's a great story. It's again, it's a great collaboration from the hatchers in Australia to the Melly being cut in Kenya to the American design. And uh, Adam is a well-loved um, uh, member of the American Jewelry Design Council as well. Um, he's a multi-time award-winning designer, and we love showcasing his work in our collection. But I do have that piece. It's actually sitting right here with me. Please, let's and go over here and take a look. Love to share it all with you. So I'm going to bring it over just because we're going to get some better light, I think, here. Spectacular. So you'll see, um, and you can actually really see the overall dimension of this, right? Like it's big. <laughs> um, and the opal is just an absolute dreamy black opal of every color of blue and green and purple with red flash that we would hope to see. I believe so this that, is something that I hope actually painted. talks to the mineral people as well. I hope you guys are digging this. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh my God. Um, but yeah, it's, it's fantastic. It's comfortable. It's beautifully smooth on the inside. And I have to say, um, until it was done in, in competition, uh, the owner never got to wear the piece because I didn't want Adam to have to refinish it <laughs> with any scratches. Yeah. So we didn't, he never got to wear the piece. So uh, great you know, story. It's fascinating. It's great to look at in the photograph because it's absolutely beautiful, but to see it as you're holding it, it gives it more um, uh, kind of uh, a gravitas, if you will. It's, it just, it looks so much more important now having seen you hold it in your fingers. A wonderful, wonderful ring. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you all enjoyed it. Now, you have a coral ring that we do not have a photograph of, but you have it live. So I was hoping maybe you could show. Yeah, we don't have we don't have a photo of it yet because we haven't even paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> so 
I'm actually going to tout this fabulous piece of, of art from Mark Kohlmuller in Switzerland, but we don't even, okay, we own it, but we haven't paid for it yet. Don't worry, Mark. I promise payment's coming. <laughs> But this is, um, so this is part of what Somewhere in the Rainbow has been doing during the pandemic is, you know, we often have so many pieces that, you know, when we go to Tucson, people hold pieces that they just want us to see. And sometimes it's not even that they want us to buy them. They've acquired something that they just want us to have an opportunity to see, which is always a privilege um, for us. But this year with No Tucson, um, I literally had boxes just showing up in the office. Mm. Uh, a couple of them, I had no idea who they even came from because they didn't come with any paperwork. So I had to wait for people to reach out to me and say, hey, did you get my shipment? And I'm like, oh, that was you. <laughs> so Ooh, okay. anyway, yeah, it was fun. But this is one of these pieces. Uh, we we have a lot of Mark Holmuller's work in the collection. And the reason for it is, is because he uh, he puts um he puts a label on perfection of setting in a way that is very unique in our industry. Uh, he is gifted and talented to the nth degree. But a couple of years ago, you'll get to also um, see and, and enjoy interacting with this piece at the museum. We bought a fabulous uh, double row neck piece uh, of every color of coral known to exist. Um, from wow. the Mediterranean, um, from Japan, um, but it's all you know, beautiful reds to um, angel skin and down to almost white. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was set. It was the piece was actually made in 1971 um, by David Webb, who is a fantastic, well-known designer um, out of New York. Uh, David has passed on, um, but his brand lives and is doing extremely well. So. Um, the, we, we found the strand of these double strand of beads because uh, Chris Smith happened to see them. And Chris never calls me and says, wow, this is amazing. You should like, he never does that. But he was so taken with this coral that he called and said, you know, I think that this would be important for the collection to look at. And we did. And, uh, and we negotiated and it, it's fantastic. You'll love seeing it when, it when you get to the museum, but we didn't have a great coral ring to go with it. And so um, Mark Holmuller's wife, Tara, she's actually from Scottsdale, and uh, she hadn't seen her parents in well over a year. So she got to come just uh, last month, and she brought me this fantastic example of um, Japanese coral in just the most gorgeous red pink. Um, it shows fantastic. It's beautifully cut. And um, it gives us a very art deco kind of feel to the ring. Um, but in fact, it's, it's newly made. It's all done in 18 karat gold. And the fascinating part of the way that this is set, and I hope that this is coming through well for all of you. Um, mm -hmm. Every one of these diamonds are single. So they're old single cut stones and all of their tables are set in the same direction. So what that means in the setting world is that you have to be crazy um, and you have to be somebody who doesn't sleep because uh, every one of the, let's say all of the faceting patterns are completely uh -huh. aligned. So you won't get a faceting pattern on the inside that one goes this way and one goes this way. Okay. They're all perfectly set table to table hours, hours and hours of all handmade work. The other thing, um, another part of what we do in our education when we're showing um, jewelry making is the, the bands on this are all individual bands. They're not, it's not, connect, oh, it, this is not one ring. This whole outer section is completely independent of what's taking place in the center. So Shelly, let me ask you a question about the diamonds. When you have them all set that way, what is the optical effect? How can someone tell that they're set that way? Does it does it reflect differently or what happens? It does. Not only does it, yeah, it does. It reflects differently, but literally it makes it look like you've got one linear diamond going on. Gotcha. That's what I suspected. Okay. It's extremely difficult to do. Um, there, you know, there are some master artisans that do this. Zoltan David does it. Mark Holmuller does it. Um, Sean Smokovich, who is actually a young up and comer um, artisan, but oh my God, keep your eye out because he's going to rock some worlds, but he does that as well. 
So um, there are, you know, there there's a handful of of people that do it. Uh, Adam, you know, I could go on, and I and I won't because I know we're we're running over. But uh, it's a it's a fascinating setting process, and it it can't be done by a machine. It can only be done by hand and and a lot of patience and a lot of tenacity um, to not bring a subpar piece to um, you know to the end consumer, but to bring an absolute perfection piece. Exceptional. Uh, Shelly, I'm going to um, move on to the next. It's another piece of jewelry. It's not a ring. We've been just looking at rings so far. Uh, I want to do two pieces before we get to the objects to art. Again, we're going to run over, but I don't think anyone cares because this is okay. fascinating. <laughs> if you have the time. Thank you for joining us. And I thank you so much. If you have to sign off, I appreciate you being here and I appreciate you coming along and, and, and learning more about Somewhere in the Rainbow. So thank you so much. Wonderful. Okay. Tell us about this piece that's uh, on my screen right now. Oh, yummy, yummy. This is a 17 karat blue spinel. Mm. And uh, this is also, you'll get to interact with this piece at the museum as well. Uh, so this spinel was actually chosen by a local artist here in Arizona. Her name is Lori Lori. Literally, that is her name is Lori Lori. And uh, she's a super fun gal, really creative. Um, but she saw this stone and she immediately saw the ocean. And, and it is truly a beautiful ocean, beautiful blue. Um, and so she, she actually wanted to represent the ocean with this piece. So so when you look at it from the angle that we're seeing it here, um, the baguettes uh, on our top, so let's go from 12 o'clock to, you know, about 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock, those are baguette diamonds that uh, are set in uh, 18 karat white gold, and that is the break of the wave. Oh, wow. As we see it come back in, you'll see this beautiful curved um portion to the ring uh right about there yeah um so that is all pave set with diamonds with round brilliant diamonds and that is actually the wave coming in and all of the colored uh savorite spinel um sapphire on the sides actually represent sea glass Nice. So the story of this is actually from the breaking of the wave to it coming onto land and leaving behind this beautiful sea glass. And it tells the story really remarkably. It's a fantastic piece. And I'm going to do a quick cutaway. If you look at my shirt and you look at the ring, hey, it's all about hey! the ocean. I love it. <laughs> That's why you wore that shirt, isn't it, Brian? That's exactly it. <laughs> love it. <laughs> okay, let's go on to this next incredible piece. I mean, this is just stunning. So much, it's so dynamic. This is another piece that literally we could do a whole hour of education on this sure. piece. Um, 3434 Imperial Topaz, uh, 3434 Carat Imperial Topaz from Red Imperial from um, Brazil. Uh, the stone came to us in 2009. Yeah, 2009. Um, it set loose uh, until Eddie Sakamoto saw it for the first time, and he immediately made this. Uh, for those of you who know Eddie, you're going to understand when I say this, he made a, a spiritual connection with a stone. Mm -hmm. And um, he actually took it away and uh, took it to California. Eddie Bases is in California. Um, and you'll see his, his architecture past in his piece. You'll see a lot of architecture in his pieces. Um, but uh, uh, it was, um, oh gosh, about a year later, he actually came to visit and he had uh, pieces of wax uh, of, of this neck piece that he actually had to try the wax on the client because it's very specific to her neck. Um, and so uh, it was fantastic to see in, in wax. Uh, this piece is actually cast in seven pieces. And I wish that I had sent you the photo of the whole necklace because it's, it's a very um, mystical and magical looking necklace. It's uh, all lined with pave diamonds that intertwine all the way around the back. Uh, he actually custom blended the, the metal to accent the stone and to not 
compete with the stone. So another educational series right there. Um, but when you see the piece, literally, it can be worn as an elfin crown with this beautiful imperial topaz that would come right down between the eyes. I see this piece in Hollywood sometimes when I'm seeing movies like... Um, um, I, I don't know, any of like the, the elfin movies um, that we see the elfin queen and uh, sure, anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know exactly uh, it, it's one of about. those pieces and you immediately connect with it. Um, it's, it, it's got fantastic movement and everything is brought down to the center to focus on that stone. And so Eddie tells the story beautifully with it coming down to a strong V it's all about the focus on the stone and it's, it's, magically done. Absolutely incredible. Is this going to be on display in Tucson? I would love to see this in person. Uh, yes, actually, this is. This is in the Topaz case, um, which I, I have to give a shout out here, Brian, forgive me. I, I don't mean to get off topic here, but I have to tell really quickly, the treasury, when you go to the treasury in the museum, um, it is magnificently laid out by uh, a woman that we all love in the gem industry, and her name is Elise Mizorowski. And Elise had the most beautiful vision and she brought it to life in a fantastic way. And the stories you will, you'll see the stories just by seeing her layout and, and it's so thoughtful the way that she did it. So thank you, Elise. Wonderful. I love the shout outs like that. Okay. This next piece is from a family that's uh, near and dear to me, a uh, former guest. This is the uh, Dreher piece. This is Julia. Everybody say hi to Julia. <laughs> He has a name. Um, I, Patrick, I don't know if you're on. It's, it's caught me in the middle of the night. This is from Patrick Dreyer. Um, it's actually uh, Patrick's dad, um, Garrett, who uh, who did this piece. Um, and Julia is a fantastic us, example. I'm yes, sorry? Just to let you know, Patrick is with us. Oh, Patrick, I'm so glad. Um, by all means, he, he's welcome to jump in and overtake me here anytime. Um <clears throat> We were actually sent, um, uh, and uh, the photo of Julia was sent to me by a dear friend of our collection, uh, Douglas Mays. And Douglas had seen that the piece was coming up for auction. Um, when we visited Patrick a couple of years ago, um, he didn't have anything available to, to, to buy. Um, and, you know, getting rough is really difficult. So the long and short of the story is that uh, we, we watched this piece on auction. We were bound and determined that we were going to have a drayer and um, we, we acquired it. And I sent the picture to uh, Patrick and um, uh, I told Patrick that I wanted he and his mom to name the piece. And he, he responded and he said, I think it's so odd that you Americans name your jewelry pieces, but oh, okay, we'll set about doing that. And, you know, um, we came back with some, you know, he came back with some very German names, you know, um, <laughs> and, and Julia is actually his daughter and mm -hmm. his mother wanted the piece named after her granddaughter. And so that's how we got to Julia. And we're so thrilled to have her in the collection. Um, she's super spunky. <clears throat> um, and come to find out what we didn't know when we bought her is this is the very first bicolor tourmaline carving that Patrick's dad did. So we have a first in this piece and um, we're honored to have it. And, you know, our collection of drayers doesn't quite meet Houston's or, you know, Bill Larson's, but we have one. <laughs> uh, Shelly, I would just have to say yet your collection of drayers yet doesn't match uh, Houston's yet. or Larson's. Thank you for saying that. All right, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we love right, having her. Um, she's actually going to be in the German showcase uh, at the museum. So she's there and waiting for all of you to come and visit and say hello to her. Wonderful. Let's go to the next one here. Oh, Lynn Strelu. Oh, Lynn, I've seen your name pop up here. I hope you're still with us. This is a brand new acquisition for us. Um, it hasn't been seen anywhere yet uh, other than the AGTA Spectrum Awards. Uh, and it is a an award-winning piece for Lynn in Canada. Um, Lynn is, uh, he's, he's, he's a master. He's a master at his art form. We have um, multiple, uh, we actually have this piece and we also have um, a hookah smoking caterpillar from him as well. But this piece um, is called The Owl and the Pussycat. And it actually bases, uh, bases around a famous poem. And you'll see that he's actually engraved that into um, 
the the uh, the pig that's holding the wedding ring because the owl and the pussycat are to be married, and they take a voyage, um, and um, and and the the pig marries them, um, and it's a it, it's a fantastic story. It's a fantastic piece. One of the things that I don't know that we're going to be able to get because I I think we're going to distort, um, but the pea pod that the owl and the pussycat are are um, floating in are lined with the most incredibly bead set, tiny Savorite garnets that you have ever seen. The eyes um, on the um, pussycat are Chris Barrel cat's eyes, right? So cat's eyes deserve cat's eyes. Uh, the other side with the owl, his wings are actually hinged and they move. Um, and then the piece can actually come off and be worn as a piece of jewelry as well. So Again, Does that owl have an ukulele with him? Is am yes. I saying right? <laughs> yes. Okay. And the best part it. is, I didn't show it in the box, but Lynn created a, a, a carrying case for it so it could come to the United States to compete. Uh, yes, that is correct. Tucson 2020. Um, so the piece actually came uh, in this box that he put, uh, he engraved the Owl and the Pussycat poem logo on the front of the box. And when you open the box and hit a button, the poem actually comes out through the speakers. Wow. It is fascinating on every detail. We uh, were fortunate enough that originally he just reached out to me and asked me if we would house it for him until he came to the United States. Um, and so not only did we house it for a short period of time, but we now house it permanently. And it's a fantastic piece. Um, and, and we love it, Lynn. Thank you so much. Um, I think there's also a photo of our hookah smoking caterpillar, which I won't go into much detail about, but it's also a fascinating piece from Lynn. Uh, and it actually looks like its creator. So it has the wire rim glasses. It has the handlebar mustache. Uh, and it's a fascinating use of um, American pearls. And um, the obviously, we, we, we see the, the pearl that's the caterpillar and his fantastic hat. And it, it, anyway, everything about it, the clear quartz base, it's uh, Lynn is magical and whimsical. And we, we love his work. Um, he is whimsical, but his work is not it's really and and expertly done it's fun it you know whimsical is a is a great word but it uh almost uh, connotates that it's um it's not important this is important but it's fun it's like someone having just a good time a it good makes chuckle with, you uh, want with to study it it makes you it draws you in and you want Absolutely. to see the details that are created within and again it doesn't start without mother nature right mother nature makes these fantastically weird shaped pearls that quite honestly nobody else would even look at and see but lynn sees into them and um, he's working on another pearl piece for us right now that's going to just blow everyone away. So thank you, Lynn. I'm so happy to see you today. Cannot wait to see it. Okay. Um, <sighs> this is this is great. Uh, um, it's not drear. It's not drear. Tell us about this. Uh, I have to tell you, the, the first time that I saw this, and I don't know if Chris Webb is with us, but um, the first time I saw this, I was actually um, standing with uh, Jeff and Chris and Russell at the Smithsonian. Um, and it was actually the morning that the Dom Pedro um, from the um, Moonsteiners, uh, not done by the done by the Moonsteiners, but donated to the Smithsonian uh, through a private collector. Anyway, we, we were standing um, in the basement and, uh, they, and Jeff pulled this piece out. And he said, it's just fascinating. Hi, Chris. Uh, it's just a fascinating piece. And um, it, it wasn't going to the Smithsonian. So we had an opportunity to actually take a look at the piece. Uh, and at the time it was owned by a very famous um, jewelry designer whose name is Henry Dunay. And Henry um, is one of the founders of the American Jewelry Design Council. Uh, he is a very important man in the modern jewelry movement and what I consider the, the modern artists of our time. Uh, so anyway, uh, the piece was actually carved by a gentleman named Alfred Zimmerman. It is um, um, Heliodor Barrel um, from the Ukraine. And it was carved by Alfred Zimmerman in Edar. Um, 
And when you touch him, he, he feels like a frog. His name is Da Vinci. And <laughs> Da Vinci actually feels like a frog when you touch him. Um, he was then given to Henry Dunay to uh, create a base for him. And uh, Henry did such a fantastic job of recreating the face of the crystal in the 18 karat gold. So Absolutely. when you see the face of the crystal and you see the pattern in the gold, he did a fantastic job of matching them. Um, this piece is really important to us simply because Da Vinci makes everyone happy. You cannot see this piece and not smile. And uh, his, the way his claws, his little toes curl around the rock on the backside, and he's got one leg up and one leg stretched out, and he's just fantastic in detail. Yeah, here's his little foot up. Uh, for those who don't know, Alfred, um, Alfred Zimmerman sadly isn't carving anymore. Uh, he has been unwell for the last couple of years in EDAR, and uh, he, he may not carve again. So again, this piece becomes very important in telling the history of carving, um, like the Dreyers, like the Ross, like the Michael Poisters, like Alfred Zimmerman. Their stories, their legacies will continue to live on in collections like ours, like other people who collect their works of art long after them, because it's an art form that is being lost. Um, a lot of people are turning to machines for carving. This is all done by hand, and, and it's a spectacular example um, of, of wonderful barrel carving and, and jewelry making. So we love this piece. And Shelly, let me add on that, that uh, the reason that uh, many people may mistake this for a dreyer is because Zimmerman was actually the apprentice of Patrick's father. So yes. he learned from the dreyer and he was actually for a while, he was Patrick's teacher. So correct. Um, Thank you for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I get I get caught up in the story and I forget those things. So thank you for remembering that because um, it really is important. And uh, we hope uh, we, we send all of our well wishes to Alfred and his family in, in Germany. 100%. All right, let's get down to our last couple pieces here. Oh, this is really fun. Uh, this is Stephen Avery uh, out of Colorado. So let me just kind of put this piece in perspective for you. Uh, Adam Neely actually made us aware of the stone and uh, hopefully someday Adam will actually get to go back and design with this. That's, that's our hope. But right now it's so beautiful in, in its loose form. We're, we're going to keep it this way for a while. Um, it's fantastic tourmaline, uh, green, blue, beautiful combination. Um, but when Stephen cut this piece, uh, he actually cut it in a way that, and I can't tell you what axis it's on because that's not my, that's not my department. Um, but he saw in this crystal, this beautiful shades of green and blue and, and a beautiful celery. It's a very warm stone. Um, and keeping in mind that this stone is about three and three quarter inches long. Wow. So imagine if you're a cutter or if you know cutting, imagine the fear of trying to put this baby on a dop mm -hmm. and to come out with this fantastic, beautiful gemstone. And it is faceted. It catches every light. It's just a fantastic piece. So we're very, very happy to have that in our collection. And Adam, I, I look forward to the day that you get to create some magic with it. Wonderful. Shelly, I think um, we have time maybe for just two more pieces. Uh, tell us about this because I know it's going to be on exhibit at the, uh, at the museum. Oh, this is our friends, the Moonsteiners. So this is uh, Tom and Bairn. Um, for those who have been to EDAR and have actually walked into their place of worship with them, you will know why I'm feeling very emotional right now. Um, Tom and Bernd created windows for their church. And uh, Brian, I think that you've seen them. Uh, I know that. Actually, if you don't mind, I'm going to actually pull up uh, a few photos. This thank is you. when I was blessed in Edar. Patrick took me down and we all went to the church there. But this is the interior of the church. Here is the uh, altar where you can see it has the mark of Munsteiner there. This is actually his <laughs> first competition piece and he lost the competition, that cross. 
Well, the church, the t- church got it. So yeah, everybody won. Out. Everybody yeah. won in the end. But God yeah, wins. A, he always does. Or she always does. Great stories. Oh, <laughs> these windows. So these windows are agate. They're Brazilian agate that the moonshiners uh, saw something in them that was. Uh, it, it spoke to them on a very spiritual level and, and you cannot walk in and not be awed when the day that we were there, we, we visited um, the cemetery that's on their property. And then we went to the church and while we were at the cemetery uh, it was drizzling and rainy and, you know, not downpour, but it was misty. It was a misty day in Stipshausen. We walked over to the church and literally after being there for a few short minutes, it was like, the skies cleared and the sun came pouring through these windows. And it was a moment in my life that I will never forget. Um, <clears throat> so these yeah, windows I think are that's all... some trick because the exact same thing happened to us when we were there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got to start thinking about this. I mean, honestly, yeah. it's, it, it, it gives me chicken skin just thinking about it. Well, and, and here's the Let's, thing. At the end of our day, that day, uh, we were closing up with the Moonsteiners and Douglas Mays was with us. He walked outside and he said, everybody come outside, come outside. And I have a photo of it, but there's a rainbow going right over the Moonsteiners house. It was like we, it just showed up for us. It was magical. So anyway, um, this particular window is actually the same tiles that are used in the, the windows in the church. And it was so special. Uh, this is actually a Bernd Munsteiner piece. Um, these tiles are cut in one inch by one inch squares and half inch by half inch triangles. It's masterful the way that it is put together. And they positioned these um, just like at the church, those darker colors are at the bottom and you get this beautiful gradient uh, as they get lighter and lighter as they come up to allow that sun to just the light to just filter through them. So this piece is about uh, four feet rectangle, about four feet by two feet. Um, And you'll have an opportunity to uh, interact with this piece at the museum as well. And we are so honored for our relationship with the Moonsteiners, um, but more because we have learned so much from them. Um, They're constant educators to all of us in the industry, minerals, gemstones, jewelry making. Um, We're really thrilled. We actually just added um, Philip Moonsteiner, who is 14 years old. He's Tom and Yetta's son, um, Mm -hmm. Baron's grandson. And uh, we just acquired his first uh, exhibition stone ever. And so that's great. Really excited to have that. And he has the family knack, let me tell you. (laughs) He is absolutely. I've heard that he's being trained by the grandfather now, by Burton. So that's wonderful to see. Yeah. So uh, a fantastic piece. Thank you for sharing that, because uh, I think, again, it's really important that we all for those of us in the gem industry, and I'm going to kind of cut minerals out here for a minute. But in the gem industry, Edar Oberstein is the Mecca um, where cutting was learned. And so many of our um, North American cutters in here in the United States today wouldn't have necessarily the fantastic creative outlets and skills without the Germans being so open and so caring and sharing with with their with their styles, with their materials, with their time and their education. So um, we're just so proud to be a part of that. Absolutely. Very well said. I mean, an incredible place to visit and very opening and loving people. So uh, yeah. I've had the pleasure of being able to visit there many times with Patrick. And it's just, uh, I can't say enough wonderful things about it. Our day with Patrick was was really special. Patrick's dad had passed away um, just within, um, I want to say about 10 days or so of us arriving in EDAR. Okay. And we knew that we had a day scheduled with Patrick and his mother. And of course, you know, we said, by all means, you're you're grieving. And now is maybe not the best time. Yeah, to take a pass. Um, But they insisted that we come. And uh, I I get chills, you know, thinking of walking through that door and and them trusting us. You know, who are we like? We're just American collectors. Um, but to come into their home during a, a very raw time in their lives. And and it was a it was a really great day. Well, I mean, I'd submit that that is probably 
the best way that they could uh, honor the memory of uh, Gerd by having you come in and looking at that work. I mean, it, it was really so much a part of, of him and a uh, wonderful family. We were so blessed. Yeah. Shelly, I'm going to go to the last piece because we are way over time, but I don't, I don't see any. I don't Sorry, see any. I'm having so much fun. Rush things up, guys. <laughs> okay, okay. Last piece, I swear to God, because this is a killer piece. We have to talk about this one. Oh, this is On to Neverland. Um, this piece uh, actually comes to us from a wonderful woman um, to our hearts. Her name is Susan Helmich. And Susan is also a member of the American Jewelry Design Council. Um, so this is a piece that she saw this layout of tourmalines. Uh, so the, the pink, the blue, um, and the wonderful orangey terracotta um, piece were all kind of laid out before her. And she saw something in each of them individually that said they needed to be brought together. And it's, it's magical. What she did is magical. Uh, she was actually went to a globe museum, the, I think the only globe museum in the world. And, and that's where the inspiration for this piece actually came from, was, was her studying of the passage of time and her trips around the world and, and the globes. And so she uh, immediately set to work on creating this piece. And while you've got this blown up, I'm going to show you one of the most interesting details. Again, this is from a master artisan, right? Susan's been at this for 40 plus years, uh, although she's only 42. So, <laughs> but if, when you look at the arrow of the piece, you'll see that time is moving very slowly. And as the arrow takes flight and gains speed, the diamonds get set closer and closer and closer together and they crescendo at this fantastic indicolite tourmaline. Okay. You, you know, would never really music look at that, that plays when you look at this. You would never look at that piece and really notice it if it weren't pointed out. But once you see it, you think, mm -hmm. what kind of like what kind of mind really focuses on those kinds of details? And and master artisans, this is what they do. This is why we promote the work of artistry and not just buying jewelry for the sake of buying jewelry. So this piece comes off. It's all done on 18 karat gold. The top portion, you'll see, uh, again, it, it beautifully starts with only metal on the one side and, and that pave circle crescendos as it comes back around and goes full circle. So it's super fantastic. We love having this piece. So the story behind this piece, though, is that while Susan was in the midst of this, um, I wanted to do a collaborative effort. And so Susan had to hand this piece off to one of her fellow um, peers, uh, Eddie Sakamoto, and Eddie got to put an element of all his in her piece. So imagine as the designer, you have to hand your baby off to somebody else and they get to mess with it. And uh, Eddie thoughtfully created this fantastic half moon with the pendulum, the golden pearl, and the pearl is loose in there. Um, so as it swings, time is always moving on. The third collaboration came in the base, and that is in the fact that uh, Susan uh, and the Moonsteiners have a very, very close relationship. They were invited to participate in the creation of the quartz base uh, that this piece rests on. Uh, so again, it's a fantastic collaboration, Moonsteiner, Sakamoto, Helmich, um, the dealer who brought the stones, Mother Nature, and, uh, and needless to say, the ocean with the pearls. So it's an all-encompassing story in one piece, and uh, it is at the museum. We look forward to you seeing it. I cannot wait. And as I promised all of you, we're going to run late. Okay, so we are at an hour and a half now. So uh, 90 minutes into our 60-minute show. Shelly, I'm going to do the five quick-fire questions to you real quickly, and then we'll go to Q&A. So you know how this game plays. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, question number one, your morning drink, tea or coffee? Coffee. Coffee. She says positively, confidently. Coffee. Question number two, your festive evenings, wine or cocktails? Wine. Wine. No whining, just wine. <laughs> Woo -hoo, love that. Your red stone, spinel or ruby? Spinel. Spinel, okay. Your red flower, red hibiscus or red rose? Hibiscus. Hibiscus. 
And finally, your mantra, YOLO, you only live once, or JOMO, joy of missing out. YOLO, baby. YOLO, <laughs> YOLO. <laughs> All right. Uh, Eloise, are we ready with the, uh, the answers from the audience? Yes, we are. Okay, we're going to blast through this. Um, question number one, morning drink, tea or coffee? Shelly answered coffee. What did our audience say? What did our audience say? Coffee. Bing, bing. Question number two, festive evening, wine or cocktails? Answer was wine. Wine, Shelly, we know you. We do Woo-hoo. know. <laughs> A lot of people obviously know me. <laughs> I guess so. Um, <clears throat> Redstone, Spinel or Ruby? No, of course. Yes. No, absolutely. Spinel. Red flower, red hibiscus, or red rose? Hibiscus. Hibiscus. Ooh. <laughs> Go Hawaii, flower of Hawaii. Mantra, YOLO or JOMO? Of course, YOLO. 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 <clears throat> that is five out of five. So all you viewers, your prize is when you go to the U of A Museum, you get to see all these wonderful things from somewhere in the rainbow. <laughs> Thank you. Let's, let's go to an A. Okay, Q and A. I know people. I know people are still with us, so I'm gonna ask you a few <laughs> questions if you don't mind. And the first one go back to what the region, one of the rings, the one with the jade at the base. What was the pinkish on the side? Was that sujolite? No, it's um, Egypt, Egyptian, and forgive me if I, I might massacre this, but it's it's a very common element. It's porf, porphyry? Oh, it's a rock. Yeah, porphyry. It's a porphyry. Rock. Yes. It's like a basalte. Oh, yes. okay. So that's, and, and it's actually, when you see it, it's actually kind of more of a purpley red. That's why mm-hmm. I thought the only thing that could come to mind was suture light. But now, mm-hmm. wow, that's really cool. Okay, thanks. That was Sarah. She and I, we have the same... Um, the same question. Um, we also have another one from uh, Dick Stada. He was asking about what's the base of the Awa and the Pussycat made of? Is that gem silica? It is gem silica. Wow. Is that common? Fantastic. Um, you know, I got to tell you, I've never, I mean, I've never seen it in this scale used in a piece of jewelry object of art before. So I'm going to say, no, it's not common. But it is a, I mean, it's definitely sets the stage for the owl and the pussycat floating along on the ocean, right? Because mm-hmm. you get the feel of ocean rock and you get blue and you get green. So it's a fantastic piece. Thank you. Shelly, and I have to really thank you for everything, but even more because you, I, I never seen Brian so much into gems and jewelry as today. <laughs> I want to be high and just so happy to see that he's really, he, he got a little bit more of the bag. Now, Eloise and I, we don't need it. We are with you and all this. But it was great to see Brian so excited talking with you. Thank you so much. The dark much. side beckons. <laughs> you know, I have to tell you, part of our mission, uh, as I sign off here, um, part of our mission really is to help unite the mineral world and the gem world. For a lot of years, we all know that, you know, it's kind of been two separate entities. But in the big scheme of the world, we are all lovers of Mother Nature and what she procures for us that we become the guardians of. And I just hope to always be a good guardian um, for all of her art, all of the artist's art, and for the owners of the collection that allow me to have the best job in the whole world. Absolutely. Wonderful. Shelly, thank you so much for being on the show. A couple quick announcements before we go. Uh, For those of you wondering, what am I going to do this weekend? Why not check out the 2021 Sinkanka Symposium? It starts this Saturday, April 24th, goes to June 7th. These are pre-recorded presentations. Uh, You can register by going to the URL at the bottom of the screen there, go.mineraltalkslive.com slash Sinkankas 2021. That's going to be an absolutely fantastic symposium. I'm eager. I'm signed up. I will be there. So uh, if you can, be a part of that. Also, tune in to Blue Cat Productions' uh, YouTube channel tomorrow. We are going to be releasing episode 41. That was our interview with Mr. Alan Hart, the CEO of Gem A, and the co-host, or no, the only host of What's Hot in Munich. Wonderful time. We got to see some incredible footage, and Al is always a, a good good fun time to hang out with. 
Uh, finally, tune back in next week. We're going to have Edward Bohm, the founder of Rare Source out of Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, on our show. That's Wednesday, April 28th. Same bat time, same bat channel. From all of us here at Mineral Talks Live, we want to thank you and send out a big aloha to all of our friends, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you all for joining. See you next week. Thank you for having me.